I think that mythologies are incredibly important to the way that we frame our experience and they are essentially the depth of human experience portrayed in symbolic form. So if we understand the Logos to be the mind of God, basically the birthplace of ideas as well as things, then mythologies are more detailed than how those things interact and we can pin our experience onto the mythology. And the original Star Wars episode four through six, so we have A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and The Return of the Jedi, I think are some of the greatest mythologies ever produced in the history of the human race. It is it has long been said, it's it's been well recognized that they are essentially modern day philosophy and, and mythology pieces, which they certainly are, but they're much, much deeper, I think, than I ever appreciated in my childhood. You know, I remember I remember being absolutely obsessed with these films. I love them. Um, most of them were before their time. I think my mother took me to see Return of the Jedi when I was maybe five or six years old at the time I fell asleep in the theater. I was too young to really know what was going on. And I had seen bits and pieces of it, but grew up with these films. And what was amazing is before they kind of destroyed them and tarnished the legacy of Star Wars with remakes and the, or, or special editions and uh, horrific prequels and sequels and wokeified garbage, which we all know, which we really don't have to cover. Most, I think most true fans of Star Wars don't consider that material to be canon anyway. And... Um, George Lucas, I think, is a victim of his own success, that the more power he got, the fewer people he consulted, and the more roles he took on. Because the greatest of the greatest, um, you know, he uh, consulted on for story, the story, he consulted on, um, he hired his professor from USC to direct the, the greatest film in that whole series, Empire. So um, George, in it, George is a um, victim of not knowing himself when he took full reign and full control and surrounded himself with yes men and yes women that's that's what you got but that's not what i'm going to be covering today i really want to give due credit to some revelations i've had about uh, star wars and new appreciation that i've developed for how incredibly deep uh, this mythology really is uh, especially if you are um, a listener of jordan peterson as i am if you enjoy the exploration of values and existential philosophy and mythology and exploring our role and our place in the world and how we should conduct ourselves in the world, especially as a man. So let's look at our main protagonist, uh, Luke Skywalker, um, who follows the hero's path perfectly, as Joseph Campbell said. And there was no greater figurehead in the exploration and explanation of mythology than Joseph Campbell who said that George Lucas was his greatest student and to come from the, the mouth of the, the world's firm, foremost master and expert on mythology, that is, uh, that is quite a beatitude to bestow upon someone. So he didn't just say George Lucas made a mythology, he said this is my greatest student and I regard Star Wars to be perhaps the greatest mythology, one of the greatest mythologies. So um, let's look at Luke Skywalker in a new light, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, when I was a boy, right, when I was younger, I thought that Luke Skywalker was just kind of a perfect person, that he was a hero, that, um, and he certainly is, he certainly is, but that he was a flawless, um, principled um, type of character that everyone should want to emulate and um, when you're young, right, so I wasn't Luke's age at the time, I was much younger, I was in the single digit ages, so much like you might look up to young man, um, you know, you, you want to be just like them, but now I'm in my early 40s and I look back at Luke and I realize Luke Skywalker is a deeply flawed uh, person. He's a, he is a, a brash, um, hot-headed, ignorant person who gets himself into trouble all the time who wrestles with things and has wrestled with things and that ultimately lead to the ultimate battle for his very soul. Um, 
I, I thought it, at one point in time that Luke Skywalker was kind of like a Christ figure, and I think that interpretation is wrong. Um, the, the temptation aspect, you know, perhaps, but it, it is not handled in that same way, especially since um, the New Testament figure of Jesus is a, essentially is deposited as the perfect person, as a living embodiment of the divine of God who is just, you know, hated upon for being being perfect. But this is really not, I really, really don't think that Star Wars is attempting to go there um, with Luke. So what do I mean by this? Well, you have these three distinct uh, chapters in the original trilogy. I feel so sorry for millennials and stuff that then go and their only exposure to Star Wars are, star are watching them in order because that makes sense to them. And then <laughs> their first exposure to Star Wars is episode one. It's like, oh my God. And like, <laughs> and like A New Hope is a follow-up to all this garbage it's uh no so let's pretend those don't exist and we start with um as you were intended to watch them uh episode four a new hope and um we have the beginning of the journey and you, luke is a boy uh essentially and he's you know I, I think the character is about 19 or so or maybe a little more a little less than that but it is essentially emotionally and uh, psychologically speaking and the to the degree of his maturity as a boy, right? As we really are at that age. And he dreams of the future, but he refuses the call, which is a essential part of the hero's journey, right? So he says, no, he's, his whole mind is basically brainwashed by this mundane existence with his uncle and I have responsibilities at the stupid moisture farm. And, um, and he can't bring himself to do it. He doesn't have the courage to do it. And only through trauma and tragedy and having nothing left does he then accept the call which is a, is a quintessential part because that in of itself when we live our lives in this way that can encompass several years i had all of these anxieties and, and inherited problems from my horrendous childhood and insecurities that i never overcame when it was time to go away to college and i had all this talent i was an overachiever and everything um, no self-confidence, but I had that. And when it was time to go away to college, I said, no, I was too afraid. And it took um, decades for me to finally move, move, not move out of my parents' house, but to be more adventurous and to embrace the fear and, and be excited by it and to move to other states and things like that. When the payoff didn't pay off, when hiding in your childhood blankets only retards your development as a human being. So it's covered very quickly in the film for the sake of time and for the sake of brevity. But the symbolic importance of refusing the call is immense because that's really what children do. Um, in Iron John, Robert Bly said, you know, the there's this call to adventure. There's basically a this little prince who represents the, the boy that needs to grow into a man. And he's um, playing in the yard with this golden ball. And there's a cage hanging in the courtyard that has the Iron John in it, who is the, the quintessential wild man, represents manhood. The king, his father, had captured him in the swamp, right? In the desert where all the our dark side is, our impulses and our wildness, right? And Iron John's body's covered in red hair. It's just ruddy like iron. And um, the boy's playing with the golden ball and it bounces into the cage. And Iron John grabs the ball and says, I'm not giving it back to you until you let me out. So that symbolizes the inner child can no longer be expressed without integration. And the key, this is what's so amazing about Iron John, the key to the cage is kept by his mother, the little boy's mother under her pillow. And so the mythology goes, um, the key, if he asks, which the little boy does, he asks, mom, can I have the key? And she says, no, no, no. And the um, moral of the story is that Robert Bly said is the key must be stolen. She's never going to give it to you. And if that ever is a, a beautiful, incredible uh, metaphor for the Oedipus syndrome that you must just make this act of rebellion and just start doing things without asking permission. And so with this act of divine rebellion, he goes ahead and he does it, but he's not going to get the per permissiveness 
of either of his parents. And so Luke, his adopted parents, <clears throat> his aunt and uncle, are not going to give him the permission. And uh, one way or another, that relationship has to be destroyed, which is what is symbolized there. The, the stormtroopers, um, they uh, slaughter his, his adoptive family, but there's something much, much deeper there in that the old relationship is destroyed and it can't work. And new relationships have to be forged. So in that moment, right, he, he transitions from the uh, adoptive parents as his parents to Obi-Wan Kenobi as his initiator. He's the, he's the initiator, right? More of a true father to, to Luke. Um, so we fast forward to the end of A New Hope and Luke by talent and his rare and very special abilities is able to sa save the day and destroy the Death, Death Star. And really what we see, what, what is so interesting is we see the level of naivete in that moment that the war is far from over, that the battle was won. I am sure after all of these accolades, we have this scene with the um, award ceremony and the medals and he's awarded a medal and he's at the top of the world, right? Top of the universe or galaxy um, that he can do anything that he saves the day that there's nothing he can't do. And um, the empire, you know, he, he has this talk with his co-pilot at, at the beginning of empire in the battle for Hoth as uh, co-pilot says, I feel like I can take the whole empire on myself. And Luke says, I know what you mean. Um, so the, the battle, uh, battle of Yavin for, uh, destroying the destruction of the death star was a success. And there was a whole lot of just raw will and talent there. And then we get into the incredible turn in the narrative in, um, the empire strikes back, which is regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. It is a phenomenal, incredible a monumentally deep film. And here is where we explore the deeply flawed um, problems that Luke has that, that are made eminently apparent to us as the audience. So <clears throat> um, Luke is uh, challenged and, and taken to his limit and um, nearly dies out in the cold and um, is essentially given a vision. This is much like a Native American um, vision through pain, through absolute like psychedelic level trauma. Um, Obi-Wan appears to him and tells him where he needs to go. And um, credit to Luke, he, he does it. He goes to Dagobah and there were really, we are what revealed, what is revealed to us is how um, egotistical and how arrogant Luke is, how short-sighted he is, how frustrated he becomes about the ship, how poorly he treats people. And I'm referring to all sentient beings in Star Wars as quote-unquote people. I, I know Yoda isn't like human, not of the same race, but in general, he has no tolerance for anyone or anything that he can't show Yoda any kindness. And Yoda is testing him this whole time and uh, is uh, very negative and only cares about what he wants, his, his own ambition. And so when, um, you know, speaking of Luke's flaws, in case you were doubting the fact that he has flaws, um, Yoda refuses to teach him, says uh, he has no patience. He's, he's too old, he has no patience. He's, um, you know, he, to paraphrase probably what, what's going on in the, character's head, assuming the character is a, if the character were a real person, Yoda would say, you know, this is, uh, this is the makings of the bad stuff. Like he's, um, full of himself yet. He's uh, unkind. He treated me. I acted like a normal, harmless little woodland imp and he, um, <clears throat> treated me, uh, very poorly and all he cares about is what he wants. And so, um, so Obi-Wan intervenes and, uh, now, <clears throat> We see, uh, you know, Luke's lack of faith in abilities and uh, getting the, the ship out and everything, and um, it has a lot of hard lessons to learn. But the hardest of which, um, which I really want to touch on, is this 
failure of the cave test. So this is a trial that uh, Luke's instructor, Yoda, tells him to undergo. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of talk about the light side versus the dark side. What does that mean? And um, I've been asked, what does that mean to me? And um, I think that the root explanation of good versus evil is way oversimplified. It is not correct at all. Um, the dark side is not necessarily um, negative emotions. It is allowing those to take hold of you. And what is so interesting there is how it's defined as the quick and easy path, the path that avoids discipline. Everything Jordan Peterson talks about is essentially like it's out of the mouth of a Jedi sage. Well, you basically, you know, <clears throat> if, if you asked Yoda, what's this light side about? He said, oh, well, you know, uh, there's, if he did, he'd probably say something like, oh, there's not a dangling participles aside. I'm not going to say it in dangling participles, but he's going to say, a, a, you know, discipline yourself, you must. No, I, I had to do it. I do a pretty good Yoda. Okay, so uh, he would say, well, you, you know, uh, th there's not much to it, really. I mean, you commit yourself to brutal, near impossible discipline to your whole, for your whole life and don't expect anything in return and, you know, be humble and don't become egotistical about things and own your fear. And um, fear in the Jedi religion is kind of like a sin. And I think that it's not really earlier when I understood it, it was like, so they never feel afraid. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't think that's it. I think that they require that eye of Horus on it. Like you must own your fear. You must, you must admit it and you must work on it and you must confront it. You cannot just turn a blind eye to it because that's where evil deeds happen, right? Like a Hitler type cr creature or Vader. These people are so afraid, they become so afraid and so insecure that they seek to dominate and control others. So the Jedi path asks, well, you must treat this fear as a, as a serious problem that you need to uh, examine and expunge immediately and admit and acknowledge. And so the cave is a face your fears, exposure, and notice this is I really had to ponder this, that is the dark side something to be avoided, you would think, right, in the light path? But it's not, because Yoda tells him you go in there. And not only go in there, but go in there defenseless. Go in there with no weapons. So when Luke defies Yoda and puts his weapons on anyway, he already failed. He failed the test right then and there. And, and Yoda knew it because um, this is about recognizing the shadow in yourself and not fighting it, not resisting it, not claiming that you're so high and mighty that the shadow does not exist within you. So Luke's job was to go in and to embrace it and face it and deal with the negative feelings and the horror of knowing what he's really capable of so that he could integrate the shadow so that he could know um, what he's facing and to not let it consume him. But you don't gain control over something. When we talk about manhood, really, it is about we have this union integration of the shadow. And Dr. Peterson talks about that all the time. He says, well, uh, wandering around like a grinning, naive little boy, which Luke Skywalker was in the previous episode, that's not what a man is. If you're not capable of doing violence, if you're not capable of doing horrible things, you have not integrated that part of you that is dangerous, that is a part of your soul. The light side, dark side question becomes, do you take ownership and responsibility for those parts of you that are horrible, that are rage filled, that are afraid? And are you at peace with those things? Do you know and acknowledge that that's a part of you so that you can control it? That's all it is really. So the, the light side is healthy because it's integrated. Whereas the dark side is ignorant, says, well, well, it's not my problem, it's everybody else's problem and all I want is power. All I want is power over other people and it doesn't matter what dysfunctions you have that you're using to exercise that power. So it has, and here we have this sinful path that has literally the quality of quick and easy. 
I don't want to get a job. I want to live off the government. I want to blame other people instead of taking responsibility for myself, you see? So it's taking responsibility for your life and your success in the world and the order that you need to impose in your life. If it's never your fault, and that's hard work, by the way, then it becomes everybody else's fault. And you have this Nietzschean resentment of the, of the world, right? So here, right here in Star Wars, we see that, and that's easier to do. Easier to say, yes, you're a victim. Everybody here is a victim. I love what Jordan Peterson says, obviously, like we all are if you're alive. And, and we've all had a childhood and a past and everything. But the point is... The dark side says, well, it's much, much easier to blame everybody else and not be disciplined. And it feels powerful, but in the end, it's, it's not, right? It's not more powerful. So Luke goes into the cave looking to not integrate and fight. And here we have his first confrontation with Darth Vader as a phantasm expression of himself. And that was, you know, when you say, do you need any more evidence that uh, uh, that this is his shadow and he needs to integrate his shadow? It's being shown right in front of him that he cuts Vader down. There, I won. I won. I, 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 through sheer skill. We'll get into that in a second. But um, I outdueled him and the mask explodes. And that is you. That is you. To say, what happened here? Why is that? Is it because um, Vader's his father? Well, yeah, there's some there's some uh, uh, allusion to that to say that this is your blood and you're, this is what you're capable of. And if you want to beat Vader, you have to look inward. You have to look at yourself. That Do you really think you're that good? You're, you're so much of a goody two-shoes that he's the bad guy and you're the good guy. You have every bit as much of a potential to be Vader as he does to be you. And we see this, this, this juxtaposition does in fact happen in Return of the Jedi. We have Luke goes there, Luke goes to the dark side, and Vader goes to the good side. They kind of meet in the middle. Um, and I believe that there's ample evidence for that. So um, now <laughs> we, we get into this. This is a failure. He is not out of the game. Yoda doesn't say, well, you know, we kick you out, but it is a problem that... Um, troubles Yoda that is going to have to be addressed that ultimately the failure can be overcome but now keep this in mind because actually Luke's duel with Vader in the bowels of Bespin actually is the cave again and I had this this epiphany I freaked out it was like well actually this is this is the next duel the first duel is a symbolic duel is a vision-based duel, so like a force-induced, kind of trance-based, meaning-based vision. And then he goes, and as fate would have it, he has the living embodiment, the manifestation of the vision in the cave again as a real duel, which is in this dark, the dark bowels of the um, that little carbonite lab, kind of, and, and moving around the, the caves, if you will, the, the mechanical innards of Bespin is the challenge of the cave again and Luke fails again. And then after that realizes that that is, that he is my father, that that is me. So you, you understand that that was a foreshadowing that Luke's um, challenge of the cave in uh, on Dagobah was a foreshadowing um, premonition of what he was going to do, but not only what he was going to do, but the way his level of development at that time and how he handled it would doom him to failure. And it did. It did. So um, <clears throat> Yoda is uh, aware of this. And when he um, he continues his training and like the, the hot-headed idiot that he is. And by idiot, I mean, there's different. It, it, it's like intelligence is a different thing. Like you can be highly intelligent, but immature and unwise and brash. And Luke has the the vision and, and the and has the realization that his friends are going to be in pain and they're going to suffer and possibly die and he doesn't know what else to do but rush in there he's going to rush in there like a one man army and save them and his teachers his wise guides his his initiators and his spirit guides Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi 
tell him, don't, do not do this. And they know, they say, um, first of all, when it comes to living a life of combat and dealing with warfare, his friends, Chewbacca, Leia, Han, are way more experienced than he is. They might not have the talent with the force that he has, but they are way more experienced and they are losing. They are they are suffering. So his teachers, when Yoda and Obi-Wan know this, and they they go and they say, Look, you know, um, this is this can only end in disaster, and the only way to make right the situation is for you to not take the quick and easy path. So Yoda saw this as an act of the dark side to go off of emotion, to not use your reason. Men, adults, we use our reason and we report on our emotions, but children, they still act impulsively. They act um, rashly. And the only solution to this problem in the, in the eyes of the Jedi masters there is to say, well, we can develop your talents to the point where you're at your full potential and then you can really do some good in this situation. But right now, this is only going to end in disaster. And it does. The thing is, they were right. I, I was, I was remember being a, a, like a kid watching this going, oh, well, Luke is just awesome. And this is just great that he did this. I didn't really think about it. When, no, they were, uh, uh, Yoda and Obi-Wan were right all along. You got your ass kicked. So Luke sarges in there, the one-man army. He plays into the trap. He's he's being set a trap by his father, Darth Vader. And he attempts to duel with Darth Vader, and he is a plaything. He is Darth Vader's plaything. That's expressed in, their, in his fighting style. It's one-handed. Um, Darth Vader doesn't exert, doesn't appear to exert any effort at all to, to out-finesse people that he's dueling. Or she does. See, that's what's interesting. In uh, A New Hope, when he duels Obi-Wan, he does. Two hands. Oh, this is hard. This is a challenge for him. But Luke, one hand. And nah, then nah, 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 Perry, repost. <laughs> You're done. And um, uh, the thing is, um, Vader doesn't want to kill Luke. But um, just to show him who's boss, he cuts his hand off. And we, we look at this and we say, well, it was Luke who needed saving. Luke was gonna die if not for this um, interpsychic connection through the Force that he has with his sister. But <laughs> when you when you look at this and go, well, what, what did I say about like Leia and Chewbacca? You know, having having way more having the experience in terms of military intelligence and doing things. He needed saving from them, Luke. So um, the really powerful part of this is failure. Uh, uh, absolutely humbling, hubris crushing, soul crushing failure when Luke is there and he's laying in this hospital bed, totally defeated. Han is gone. Han has been abducted. Uh, they have lost everything. The uh, rebel fleet is in shambles. What happened to the I could take the empire on myself thing? What, ha what happened to the hero of Yavin thing? What happened to the I, I blew up the whole Death Star by myself thing? And the gold medals and all that. And that, that's like your little um, junior high participation trophies and all the your, your college degrees for worthless things you got. What happened to all the accolades when faced with the real world? They're all total BS. They're nothing, nothing. That, and that hit me hard, by the way, the cold, hard shock of the real world versus the ivory tower and the dumb luck and sheer talent that got him through that before. And now, please rewatch re this scene and look at it again and go, um, we have the, the completion of the cave exercise made manifest in the world, which is that. What, what is this deal like he, he at the time, right, when he was first going through it? Why, why is my face on Darth Vader? And he goes, your face is in Darth Vader because you're my son. <laughs> I'm in you and you're I'm a part of you and you're a part of me. Crushing, crushing. The lines between good and evil are not so clear anymore. Luke Sarge is in there and he gets his ass kicked royally, royally. So, so his friends are demolished, 3PO's in pieces. Um, they have to run away. 
and Luke is laying there in his hospital bed with with a hand with a prosthetic hand because it just got cut off completely demoralized and demeaned and humiliated and this is how we close the film we have the fires of initiation we have the fires of of manhood here and your soul is forged through the fires of your failures not through not through insulation and not through only doing things you know how to do but through this, these harsh and heavy realities of dealing with the challenges of life. And you see here now, the, 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 essentially you have childhood, uh, um, episode four could be called that, right? It could be called the optimism of childhood. And um, <laughs> uh, episode uh, five, so empire could be called uh, becoming a man, the, the, the trials trial by fire of becoming a man. So at the very end of this film, you have defeated Luke, who we look back at it and we say, well, you, you, you did it your way. Can you still believe that Luke Skywalker is this perfect, flawless um, angel of a hero person when he, uh, through his own underestimation of his, of his, of his enemies, and his arrogance and his abilities and his total inability to rationally read the situation was completely and totally demolished. It was physically maimed, nearly died. Han Solo might never be seen again. You know, he's essentially been his best friend up to this point. And um, essentially has lost everything and also realizes that there are th there are things, there are secrets that his teachers have kept from him, from his own good. And now he has to deal with this, this ignorance. He does say, you know, Ben, why didn't you tell me? But then he's got to think about, well, why wasn't I told? And I think if you're inside the character's head, he's kind of like, well, I mean, like I, I could kind of see, oh, why wasn't I told? Well, it's because I'm stupid. This is because this is the shit that I pull. This is the thing that I did. They were right the whole time. So now he's got to go, there are, there are these people who are infinitely wiser than me that are on my side that have hidden things from me for what they perceive to be my own good. And I have to find out why. So when we go into Return of the Jedi, now this um, film... I think it does have a few problems. Like I, th I think Lucas's obsession with animatronics was going bonkers at this point. Uh, the overuse of puppets and things and cutesy Ewoks, which I believe the original um, draft of this was it was going to be the Wookiees home world, but they made them Ewoks to make plush Ewoks for girls and sell them or something. There's some marketing decision. So the I'm sorry, a Jedi does have some issues, but um, it is redeemed entirely by a few things. So <clears throat> recall that in Empire, Luke sarges in single-handedly and gets his clock cleaned. No contest, <laughs> not, not even a challenge. So then we have the rescue of Han Solo and Luke sarges in, but not unintelligently. He's got people on the inside. He has intelligence. He has plants. He has... Leia there, he has um, Lando there, he has um, Chewbacca there as, a, as another kind of um, plant who is uh, put there to be released later. He has a plan with R2-D2, with the lightsaber and all this. He, he's got uh, some cunning, and this is really how a man starts to approach his life, right? That life is not just ideology, it's not just passion, it's not just will but you need to think things through, right? If you're gonna win at war or anything else. So life being kind of warlike, look at the difference and how he's approached this. There's a plan. The plan does not go flawlessly. The plan does not go perfectly smoothly and it never does. And it's really important, I think, for the realism to be there, for this to be kind of a true mythology to say, well, no, the plan just, you know, it was Ocean's Eleven. The plan is the plan is the plan. No, there's there's Rancor monsters and there's, there's fuck ups and there's, all kinds of things, but it does ultimately succeed. It, it does get executed. 
Now, we have Luke walking in there and we see a different Luke wearing black. Black is the symbol of mastery. To me, when I saw that, I thought black belt. Because when you see Luke, um, first of all, there's a lot of Kurosawa and the, the inspiration in Star Wars. And we know that from how George Lucas originally thought and, and um, originally was going to kind of be like a samurai f type of film. And there's a lot of samurai in it in the Jedi Order and things like that. But Luke is basically wearing a gi. He wears like almost like your karate gi in, in episode four. So <clears throat> the wearing a black, the way that it was explained to me when I got my black belt was this is a, um, in the system I studied was the, you walk in with a white belt and you're innocent, clean and innocent like the color white. And as you acquire knowledge and these skills, your soul is made black from the knowledge that you have. So you wanted to be a dangerous person? Congratulations, now you're a dangerous person. You're a black belt. Let it be a black stain on your soul. Really? And this is exactly what, what has Jordan Peterson been talking about? Is those, those who have swords but choose not to use them. You have integrated the shadow. That's what that means. You have taken ownership of the fact that you're a dangerous person, that you're a dangerous thing. So it's implied that Luke is trained between um, these two episodes, right? And he appears and he has some skill, legitimate skill, that has been elevated above and beyond where we had seen him before. He doesn't just charge in there, guns blazing. He relies more on cunning and his abilities to get in. He um, attempts to execute the plan, goes awry a little bit here, a little bit there. But in the end, he succeeds, which is a, which is a big deal. It's a big thing. Now let's go to the end of the film where really this is the crescendo to the entire original trilogy and is incredibly powerful and incredibly deep. And we have literally the battle for Luke's soul on the line here, which must be through his own experience. Obi-Wan tells him, I cannot interfere. I, am, I cannot help you with this. And this is the ultimate initiation. It's sink or swim. Uh, life is not endless preparation. Luke has to do it and he has to do it himself. And he has to confront Vader as his destiny demands but he can't get the assistance of his teachers. He has to apply what he's learned. And we see Luke thrust into this, this duel, first of all. We know that Luke is being brought into the brink of turning to the dark side. That is the agenda. That's what the emperor wants. That's what Vader wants. Vader wants his son there with him. How is he gonna do that? Well, we have Oh, an amazing thing. This is one of the most beautiful things because here, here like, um, the script could have just called for, and now they sword fight. Tink, 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 tink. Is that what you saw on the screen? Little, little back and forth with the sword? No. You saw an emotional apocalypse. And the choreography and the way it's portrayed and the movements used and the way the, what the actors are doing are incredible. It is, it is a, a absolute, um, uh, um, a thunderstorm of, of, of emotion and things that are going on. So we have the beginnings of the duel. We have the um, coaxing of coaxing and coaxing and coaxing of anger out of Luke while the emperor is taunting him. Like, I am going to kill all your friends. You had a plan. You had a plan, which was you were going to do your thing. And then the Death Star was going to blow up. And, you, you know... You'll win through sacrifice, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? You see all this going on out here? We know what you're up to. We know the plan and all your friends, they're all gonna die. How do you feel about that? So you want the lightsaber? He's, he's coax, trying to coax the dark side out of Luke. And the dark side in this film is no different than the shadow side of Jung. It's just, again, where you choose to dwell or where you live or how much of a facet of your personality it becomes. So to interpret that as good or evil, as something that doesn't really apply that much to our daily lives is, is completely wrong. It does. 
So revenge, he gets the lightsaber and um, has the duel again with Vader. And Vader is um, um, a, a masterful opponent. And Luke cannot win. And then you have the, this pivotal moment where Luke is literally hiding from Vader, like cowering under the stairs. And he, you see in his face, he is paralyzed with fear. It's like he, he is thinking, I cannot do this. I cannot win. There is no way at this point when it comes down to a contest of skill, there is no way for Luke Skywalker to beat his father in a duel like this. And Luke, um, we, we have this notion about giving in to fear. And Luke is so terrified, he is paralyzed. He doesn't know what to do. And um, Vader is probing, 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 probing. And he goes somewhere just to say, you know what, uh, forget you. I'm going to go after your sister. I'm going to go after your family. And uh, Luke is hurled into a blind rage that, like a unknown force from inside of him, propels him to unleash a flurry of attacks onto his opponent. And Vader is helpless to defend himself from Luke. So we really need to unpack this because what has happened here, um, Musashi in his book of five rings said, the thing to do if you want to become indestructible is to think nothing but of the destruction of your opponent. Because if you are concerned with self-preservation, you will become protective, right? You'll be fearful, afraid to be cut. And if you're afraid to be cut, ironically, you become fearful. You don't assert yourself to attack and you become cut and you lose. Um, now, this is a, a truism, right? But it really wasn't a strategy as far as uh, Luke was concerned. Um, it is a, a place that he had to go to. And it is really fascinating to see, to know that there is no skill here. There really is no application of skill. There is no way to defeat Darth Vader one-on-one, -on -one, at least between Luke and Vader and when he went to the dark side fully, which is the noble aspect of the dark side, the shadow side in men, which is that rage-filled, dominating protector instinct. Interesting, isn't it? Like that's where he had to go. Threaten me all day, I'll become afraid. But what threatens, uh, or rather, what makes a man fearless is to threaten his family, <laughs> which is exactly what happened. And we have the flurry of emotion and rage against skill. And Vader is overwhelmed. He is cut to pieces, literally. And um, the fight is concluded by, <clears throat> there's this amazing part of it at the end where Vader is knocked down and is gasping as his life support system had been damaged um, by Luke's blade. And he is defeated, but he's still, Vader is still kind of helplessly holding his lightsaber in the air. And Luke is, beating down on that, that sword is hammering on it with all of this hatred and rage as if as if to s extract his ultimate revenge like um, you know as if to say you tortured me with this lightsaber you um, teased me with it you used it as an instrument of, of death and um, and uh, pain against me and my friends and he and there was no there was no um, combat oriented there, there was no fencing skill there he is just hammering hammering and taking the the last little bits of emotional energy out on on his sword and with in a final moment of malevolent revenge cuts vader's hand off an eye for an eye you take my hand i take yours um so <clears throat> now 
the ultimate test of Luke's soul is, is here, right? We know that Luke went to the dark side. We know he went there because um, Emperor Palpatine is saying good and is clapping and is congratulating it. And then explains to Luke why, how he won. Your hate has made you powerful. Look, and it did. I, th th this is the thing is that really, it is not so much a condemnation of that behavior, um, which is, I think, an immature interpretation of it to say, well, he was evil and the evil is bad. No, 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 no. He had to do it. He had to do it. He had to go there. Vader had to be defeated. He couldn't just continue the way he was. There was no diplomacy there. There was no way to reason with him. So um, to think that this was somehow a mistake or that we shouldn't go there when we need to would be wrong. Um, I've been there. So like I was picked on by a bully and I, you have this moment where you're no longer afraid because you just want to hit that person and that's all you want to do. Um, I was picked on by a bully in like junior high and it was like, um, scary, like, scary guy, but, uh, same, it's very, very much the same thing. It's like, that's the purpose of mythology is it's a framework for us to hang our own experiences on. And, um, you snap like I did, I snapped when I'm just so full of rage and revenge oriented feelings for this person that I don't care what you do to me. I only want to hurt you. And when you go there, you're invincible. And I slugged him and he fell to the ground, rolled around on the ground. And the rush of serotonin flooded my brain. It was like a psychedelic feeling of raw masculine, like chest beating masculinity. It was an unbelievable feeling. And I liked it. <laughs> you know, it feels good. That's why bullies pick on people because it feels good to them. So, um, I, I have to admit, like, uh, the going there, the, I could fantasize about doing that to my father, cutting him to pieces with a sword and then cutting his hand off for just a little extra, a little extra spice on top, you know, um, not that I would do it. I wouldn't. But um, I could go there, you know, in my fantasies, which is really what integrating the shadow is all about. And then throwing the lightsaber away is Luke's reclamation of his soul to balance it out. It's to say, I'm not going there. I'm not becoming that. I did go there. But then the temptation here from the Emperor is now let's continue this. And Luke throws it away. That was the beautiful moment. It says, no, you lost. I'm not going there. I'm not going there forever. I went there, but I'm not staying there. I'm going to reclaim my soul. That's Luke passing. Luke passed. So if you imagine kind of the Jedi spirits watching over this whole drama, watching it with a bated breath, because it's the real thing. It's the real deal. And um, you could see them almost cheering when he passed, he passed the ultimate test, but he had to be tested. There was no other way, not tested in a theoretical way or in a training oriented way, which they had their doubts, right? Like, well, he fails the test we put in front of him and he resists the training. But when the real deal happens, Luke um, is able to recapture his soul. He's able to say, I, I, I did use it. It is a part of me. See, and that's what the light side is. The light side isn't never go there because that was never told to him like, oh, no, you did a bad thing. No, 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 no. You go there. It's a part of you, but can you rein it back? Can you control it? Yoda said, you must learn control. It is a part of us. So that's the interesting thing is like that the light side of the force, they actually recognize the dark side is a part of the human soul. And that's how we become good. It's not by being naive, but by integrating the shadow and the shadow doesn't believe in any of it. The shadow is more nihilistic. Shadow is more like, no, no, no. I don't need to turn an eye to the problems that I have. I only need to get ahead in life through whatever means are necessary and nothing is my fault. And that's the real difference. The real difference between the good and the light side is not goody, goody two shoes versus the bad guys. If that were the case, it would play out like a, like a cartoon for children. It's not that the light side is wise and integrated between the dark and the light. And the dark side is, is a nihilistic, um, victimological, insecure, power mongering, and, uh, uh, um, fascistic and despotistic and all the rest. So <clears throat> now uh, Luke says no. And now it's Luke, Luke being killed by uh, the emperor and Vader 
we we transition to him we get almost like a pov from from him and um it is revealed to vader that his whole life with the emperor was a lie that here he actually thought the emperor was his the emperor referred to him as a friend my friend and this guy is my mentor and he's showing me the right things and he sees just how quickly and easily he was discarded the moment that vader is defeated in battle the moment that the emperor finds somebody better to use he is discarded worthless take your father's place you know here is uh lord vader the the you know essentially the head honcho of the whole uh, imperial army seconded only to the emperor who is so callously discarded and and vader knows well it just a matter until he discards my son when he finds someone better and killing Luke was never the plan. Vader never wanted to kill Luke. Vader wanted his son on his side. And so we had, examine this, it's like yin and yang, right? Luke has the particle of the dark side in him that he needed to explore and express and go there, go to the shadow to defeat Vader. Vader has a particle of the light in him that Luke saw. They're very analogous, these two characters go together. And Luke saw good in him that Vader didn't realize. And it was only until, like yesterday, did I realize the good, what is the good in Vader that Luke senses is Vader's love for his son. That's what it is. That's this one thing, there's this one thing that Vader won't admit to, that he himself was ignorant of. Luke really wasn't sure. He had a sneaking suspicion, like, I don't think you want to kill me. But this whole time, Vader was not expecting. Vader wanted to provoke Luke and try to draw him out, but Vader was not expecting to be on the receiving end of that kind of a beating. Within his life, basically. I mean, it basically pretty much kills Vader. <laughs> and then the little lightning, residual lightning from um, the Emperor finishes him off, but the the crisis was not just one thing. I think it was twofold that one um, Vader realizes that he had been living a lie that he's just a pawn in the scheme of this wicked man who didn't really care about him probably thought that he did and was uh, discarded and that the Emperor really is going to kill his son, which is really the one thing that Vader loves. That's his one connection to his humanity and makes this decision and is similarly impelled to do right. You see how it was a, a guttural impulse, just like Luke's particle on the dark side became the hate-filled rage, was the guttural impulse to act from the will to destroy, which Luke needed, his shadow. And Vader, who lives in the shadow, needed the guttural impulse to do right, to do right by his moral sensibilities that he had suppressed this whole time and throws the wicked emperor down the fucking well, throws him down the well. And um, Vader is dying. Joseph Campbell felt that the removal of Vader's mask was one of the most powerful moments in cinematic history. Um, because, so Vader admits, Luke, you were right. I do have good in you. Tell your sister you were right. So he has, after all of that, uh, a love for his children. And what Joseph Campbell said about the removal of the mask was, look at him. He's a worm. He's a degenerate, beat up, rotten worm. But as the executor of a system, it's a mask that you wear. He's like a robot. Jo jo uh, Joseph, which he basically is, right? Darth Vader's like a cyborg. He's kept alive through <clears throat> the intervention of all this machinery apparatus. So, um, the, the powerful thing about it is that he's like a, he's like a, a, a government, uh, a politician. He's like a Hitler. He's like a Pol Pot. He's like a Mao. He's a, wears the uniform of the state as the, um, the, the empire essentially is the, um, in, in the way it's, it's portrayed is basically a socialistic Nazi dictatorship militaristic socialist dictatorship like the Nazis. You know, even Joseph Campbell said in his interview with Bill Moyer, the removal of that mask, you, you take off the mask, the illusion of the power and the accolades of the state, and he is a worm. 
He's he's a degenerate, disgusting worm. And that's who you really are. When you, you when you develop yourself through a system, you're not developing your humanity, is what um, Joseph Campbell said. So I, I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you think. Um, I really enjoy these discussions, and I hope you have a great day. And enjoy the original Star Wars trilogy. God bless. <laughs>